Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the brand new problem from today's leak code contest, number of ways to rearrange sticks with K sticks visible. A pretty long name and this is a pretty difficult problem. And it happens to be a dynamic programming problem. So as with most DP problems, it's about how we can break this problem down into sub problems and then solve those sub problems. So we're given a list of n candles and each of them is a unique size of lengths from 1 to n. We want to rearrange the sticks such that exactly k sticks are visible from the left side. So basically with this input we would have three sticks that are visible. 1, 3, and 5. The reason why 2 is not visible is there's a candle to the left of it that's even bigger. So basically when we say visible, it's if you're looking from the left, which candles would you be able to see? You would not be able to see 2 because 3 is blocking it, and you would also not be able to see 4 because 5 is blocking 4. And so we're just given these two inputs, n for the number of candles, k for the number of candles we want to be visible, and we want to return the total number of ways we can arrange it. And it could be a really big number, so we want to make sure to mod it by this large prime number. So let's first try the most brute force of the first idea that you might have. What would happen if we put 1 in the first position? What would happen if we put 2 in the first position? And what would happen if we put 3 in the first position? How many different ways can we get candles arranged in each of these three paths? Remember, we start with three candles and K is two, so we want exactly two candles to be visible. If we put one in the first position, what's going to happen to our K and N values? Well, then we get to the subproblem of two, three, right? So basically what we did is we took the number of candles available to us and decreased it by one. So N is going to be two here. And since we put one in the first position, we know for sure one is going to be visible. So we took K and set it to one. We decremented K by one as well. So this is pretty simple, right? If we choose one as the first candle, we get a pretty simple sub problem. But the, the difficulty is going to come when we go along these two paths. The, and that these two paths are the reason why if we do it this way, the overall time complexity is going to be big O n squared times k. That's not a bad solution, and it's definitely the most intuitive solution that you'd probably come up with, but it happens to be that we can get an even better solution that is going to be n multiplied by k. It's just going to be a little more tricky to arrive there. But first, let me just tell you why this is going to be a little bit difficult for us. If we put two in the first position, then we could arrange it such as, then we'd have two candles left over, right? The candles would be one and three. Notice how one candle, three, is going to be larger than two. So that could possibly be visible, but one would not be visible. It's still a candle that would have to go after two, but it would never be visible again, right? Because there's going to be a two blocking it. So this is why we're going to need three variables along this path. What we're going to say here is n is now going to be one n is one because there's only one candle remaining that could possibly be visible k is going to be also one because we we took the total we needed two candles to be visible if we put two in the first spot that means two is going to be visible but we need one more candle to be visible that's why k is going to be one and we're also going to have a third variable let's just call it m basically m is going to be the number of candles that come after two but that can never be visible again. We still have to keep track of them because we could arrange these candles in multiple ways, but these candles are never going to be visible. N is keeping track of the candles that can still possibly be visible. So as you can see, this is going to require three variables. That's why the time complexity is going to be bad. But there's actually an easier way we can break this problem down. Instead of considering if one was in the first position, two was in the first position, and three was in the first position, let's consider if all three of these candles were actually in the last position. Does that make our subproblem a little bit more simple for us? Let's think about it. If one was in the last position, that means we could possibly arrange things like two, three, and then put a one here, or we could do three, two, and put a one here. Notice how since one is the smallest value, there definitely exists values that are greater than it. Therefore, one, if it's in the last position, is not going to be visible. So basically what we're saying is if one goes in the last position, then we're going to have two candles left over that could possibly be visible. Basically, we're taking n, taking it from three, and reducing it down to two. 
our k value is going to remain 2. Why does k stay as 2? The reason is simple, because initially we needed two candles to become visible. One is not visible, so we still need two candles to be visible. Basically, we're saying is the new sub problem is basically how many ways can we arrange the candles two and three such that two of these candles can be visible. So along this path, n, the, the new sub problem becomes n equals two, k equals two. And it, that's reduced from what it was up here. The exact same is going to be true if we put 2 in the last position. Notice how if we put 2 in the last position, it's not going to be visible. Because no matter what, we have a value 3 that is larger than 2. If 3 comes before 2, then 2 is not going to be visible. That's true in this case, and it's also true in this case where 3 is before 2. Basically, what we're discovering is as long as the value that we're putting in the last position is not the greatest value in the array, it's not going to be visible. So what we're saying is the subproblem can then be reduced again to n equals 2 and k equals 2. But the, the only difference is going to be in this last case where we're putting the largest candle in the last position. No matter what then, in that case, for example, in this case, or here, since 3 is the largest candle, it's going to be visible no matter what if it's in the last position, right? So this is a different subproblem, right? What we're saying here is we're still looking at n equals 2, right? Because these two candles could still possibly be visible. Nothing's blocking them, right? We put the 3 in the last position. So n is still going to equal 2 in this case. We have two available candles to choose from. But k is going to be 1. Why is k 1? Because we know for sure there's at least one candle that's visible. So since initially we required two candles to be visible, we have one that's visible now. We can reduce this k equals 2 now down here to k equals 1. And for each of these branches, of course, we know that we could continue going down and down until we got to the base case. Now, what is the base case going to be? Notice how if we had, let's say, two candles, right, one, two, and we wanted both of these candles to be visible, there's only one way to arrange it, right, from smallest to largest, right? Put the smallest one at the beginning, then put the next one, and so on, right? So if we wanted k equals two, both of these to be visible, there's only one way. Basically, what I'm saying is, you know, if we had maybe even three candles, right, and we had k equals three, we want all three of these candles to be visible, there's only one exact way. So what I'm saying here is, if the base case n equals k is true, then we're going to return 1. So that's one. Of, that's basically the base case. Now let's think about a different base case. What if I had two candles, right, and I wanted exactly 0 of them to be visible? If n equals 2, but I want 0 to be visible. Now this is impossible, right? So in this case, we'd have to return 0. What if the opposite was true? What if we had an empty array, right, but we wanted two candles to be visible. Now we don't have any candles to choose from, basically n equals zero, right? We have no candles, but we need two to be visible. Therefore, we have to return zero because this is also impossible. So basically, if either n or k equals zero, then we have to return zero. That's another base case. Now, of course, if we continued on these paths, it would be really complex, right? That's why we can use a cache to go ahead and store repeated work. Notice we already have some repeated work, right? Both of these branches lead to the same result. And so looking at this tree and looking at what we just went over, what is the recurrence relation? What's that equation going to be? Basically, dp of nk we know that whatever we have, like whatever the n value is, there's going to be exactly one branch that is where is where n is going to be decremented by one and k is going to be decremented by one. And that's going to be when we put the largest candle at the last position. Taking this, we can say that this is going to be equal to dp of n minus one and k minus one. But that's not it, right? Plus... We have to include a plus for the remaining branches. We know all the remaining branches over here are going to be the exact same. Now, how many branches are going to be the exact same? We know one branch is going to be here. That means the remaining branches, basically n minus 1, are going to be the exact same. So we can say n minus 1 multiplied by dp. Now, what are these branches actually going to be? Basically, n is decremented by 1, as you can see. k stays the same, so that's what we can say for this dp. 
n minus 1, k stays the same. So this is actually the equation. Once you can arrive at this equation, this problem becomes a lot simpler. And as you can see, based on the dp dimensions, the overall time complexity of this is going to be big O n multiplied by k. That's also going to be the memory complexity. Once you can arrive here, and yes, it is tricky to do so because you have to consider, you know, if one was going in the last position, if two was going in the last position, that's not super intuitive. Most people would assume that one would go in the first position, two would go in the first position, but it works out a lot easier, as you can see, when you do it the backwards way. With that being said, let's jump into the code now. So as I mentioned, we are gonna have a DP cache. So let's just make it a hash map in this case. And we're gonna do this recursively with our cache. So I'm gonna define a function inside a function. We have N and K as the variables that are gonna be passed in. And we know that one base case was if n is exactly equal to k, that means there's only going to be one way that we could possibly arrange the sticks. Now, the other base case is if n was equal to 0 or k was equal to 0. Remember, and in that case, we know that it's impossible for us to rearrange the candles. The last case is if we've already computed n, k. So basically, if n, k is in dp, then we can return whatever happens to be in our cache, right? And the last part is basically once you figure out the equation, you have solved the problem. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and type out that equation. So it's going to be dp of nk is going to be. So we know that one case is basically where we put the largest candle in the last position. Basically, in that case, we're saying that we are remote, we're decrementing the total number of candles available, obviously. And we're also decrementing K by one, basically, because since we put the largest candle in the last position, we know for sure that it's going to be visible. So we're going to take that and add it to N minus one multiplied by DFS of N minus one, K stays the same. This portion is basically if we put any of the other remaining candles and we know the other remaining candles is N minus one. That's how many candles there are other than the largest candle available to us. And for each of those candles, the DFS is actually gonna be the exact same. Because if we put those candles in the last position, our K has to stay the same. Basically, we're saying that the number of visible candles has not changed, but the number of available candles has been decremented by one. So this is the recurrence relation. Once we've computed it, we can just go ahead and return it. So I'm going to copy this and then return that. Last but not least, we're going to return our depth for search function. We actually have to call it. So we're going to call it with the initial N and K values given to us. Don't forget to mod this by... 10 to the power of 9 plus 7 because it could be a really large number. So this is an optimal solution, n times k, big O of n times k. Now, for some reason, it is time limit expired for me. So let me show you the actual dynamic programming solution as well. So this is the real dynamic programming solution, the bottom up solution. I'm not going to explain it too in depth because it is pretty similar to what we did up here. Basically, we are initializing one base case where n and k equals one, and that's going to be set to one. I think that is pretty self-explanatory because we do need at least one base case to be initialized in our cache. And then we're basically just iterating from here to here. And the reason I'm starting here at n equals two is basically because we already have the n equals one case initialized for us here. And if I had any, if I started this at n equals one, then we'd go through every k value. And basically what we'd be computing is n equals one and let's say k equals let's say four or something, right? And this would always return zero because we know that if we only have one candle available, there's no way we could possibly have four candles to be visible. So that's why I'm starting at n equals two. And then for basically each pair of NK, we're basically doing the exact same equation we did up above. Now, one thing I'm doing is I'm calling DP get getting this tuple. Now in Python, the way this function works is if this tuple does not exist in our DP cache, I'm returning a default value of zero, which is the appropriate thing to do in this case. And I think once you can understand this recursive approach, you could probably come up with the dynamic prog programming approach mostly pretty easily. And if you really need to, you can draw like the dynamic programming chart, like two dimensional grid for that dynamic programming solution if you need to. But I think this solution is pretty self-explanatory for some reason. It just doesn't get accepted on leak code. I don't know why. But I overall hope that this was helpful. If it was, please like and subscribe. It supports the channel a lot and I'll hopefully see you pretty soon. Thanks for watching.